Okay. I want to welcome everyone that has joined us um, currently. Uh, so you want to be a consultant. We have Michael Sandman from SCORE Boston chapter with us today. Um, he's going to have tons of information for you all about being a consultant. So as we get started, I want to just uh, explain to you a few things that SCORE does, and just in case you're not aware of all the things that we do. Uh, one is we share information. Uh, website has just tremendous amounts of information that you can use as a business owner or as a business startup. Lots of free tool uh, templates and tools that you can download. Um, templates for everything from cash flow, business plans, marketing plans, um, budgets, uh, many things that you can imagine. Uh, lots of uh, articles, blogs, and videos that you can partake in to um, expand your knowledge base. Uh, we also offer training in the form of workshops and webinars. Uh, we will be running uh, webinars this fall up through about mid-December. We have a lot of really great topics, so I strongly encourage you to check those out. And then we'll take a break for the holiday season and we'll start back up probably around the second week of January. So um, definitely watch for our newsletter and um, see what we've got coming up. Uh, the most important thing that SCORE does, however, is the mentoring. It's 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 really what uh, is the heart of SCORE. Um, our mentors are volunteers and they want to give back to the business community. And they want to work, we're working with those that are trying to decide if small business is right for them. We're working with those that are in the planning phase and we're working with those that are all already in business. Uh, folks come to us with all kinds of um, questions, goals, um, you know, of, of any topic that you can imagine. Uh, beginning session is to learn about, learn about you, find out how we can help you and come up with a plan. Our mentors work as a team, uh, meaning that it, they're often consulting with each other to help make sure that they have the best knowledge for their client. Uh, they're bringing in another a mentor to assist when needed. Um, it's it's not just a one-on-one. -on -one. You've got a whole team of people that are behind you and want to help you succeed. So I strongly encourage you to reach out for a mentor. It's a great relationship to have uh, as you're going through the, your, your small business journey um, to help bounce ideas off of or get answers to questions you might come up with. Uh, to get a mentor, it's very, very easy. You can scan that QR code on the screen or you can go to the score.org website, put your zip code into the blue box and that will match you to the chapter nearest you. It'll ask you some questions about how we can help you. And then that chapter will match you to a mentor that can assist you. Uh, we do anticipate a really significant crowd with us today. So we are going to use the Q&A button on your Zoom bar for questions you want asked to the presenter. We will try our best to get to, to as many questions as we can. Um, and we'll probably, and it'll be the questions that are more general. Um, certainly, we, we won't necessarily be able to get into really in-depth questions about your particular business, but that's where where a mentor would come in to help you um, if you can schedule with a mentor, but we will try and get to as many questions about what's being presented as possible. We will are recording and you can find that recording in about 24 to 48 hours on the score.org um, slash Boston website. Um, I got a little picture there that shows where you can find it on the um, blue bar of the, the website there. So I'm going to go ahead and pull down my screen and um, give Mike a chance to um, pull up his information. And um, he'll just give us a quick, um, tell us a little bit about himself real quick. Okay. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, I assume that, uh, or hope that you can all see that. Um, looks all right. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, and uh, for those of you who are used to seeing presentation mode, I have a preference and my computer seems to have a preference uh, to uh, uh, have the thumbnails over there on the left. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I happen to like that. I hope you, uh, you won't find, you'll find that helpful rather than distracting. Um, okay, so I'm Mike Sandman. I am a mentor at SCORE in Boston uh, and I have been since, uh, uh, since 2015. Uh, and um, uh, prior to that, I spent about 25 years as the uh, managing partner of a consulting firm that um, 
uh, grew from about seven people to about 75. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I was a solo consultant. Uh, so I've done uh, done a couple of things in the consulting world. And when I when I first was interested in becoming a consultant, I actually went to a workshop uh, that uh, uh, was run by somebody who I knew uh, who uh, was a consultant, and it was a paid workshop. Uh, and uh, he he told me um, uh, told me some things that were very helpful. Some of them are actually going to be in here, and I'll I'll mention them. Uh, and then the rest of this is uh, all information that's um, that I put together uh, in order to help you uh, if you're interested. So um, the topics, you know, why do you want to become a consultant? What does the term mean to you? And that's something that uh, with a large group like this, uh, I'm afraid we can't, uh, I, I, and we're not in person. So I, I can't ask you to raise your hands and tell me, but think about it yourself. You know, what is it that you want to do? Does it, what does it mean to you? Um, and uh, then we're going to talk about why the people in firms hire consultants. You know, what's our value uh, in the marketplace? And understanding your market, how to differentiate, focus, um, how to market and how to sell your services and some nuts and bolts, how to write a proposal, what to charge, um, how to figure out what to charge, setting up a limited liability corporation, something that's very important to do. Uh, and a little bit about partnering and virtual firms and we'll, we'll wrap up. So uh, if you have questions as we're going along, please do put them into the Q&A and we'll pause every once in a while and get to them or uh, uh, Teresa will uh, feel free to interrupt if there's a question that needs to be that you think could be answered right then and there and I'd be happy to do that. Okay. So um, three news items from recent reports. Um, Democratic consultants should stop working for corporate clients. So there are consultants who work for political parties. Uh, consultants to take care of plants. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, the PAC-12 hires a consulting group to refer to review football officiating. So there are all kinds of consultants, all sorts of either solo or small groups or even large groups that will help all kinds of organizations. There are consultants that will help nonprofits. Uh, my uh, former partner, uh, who's now retired, um, is doing that. That's what that's what he set himself up to do uh, when we uh, when we both retired. So uh, there are so many different things you can do uh, and think about, you know, what, what's your market? What's your expertise? Uh, what will people pay you for? Uh, and, uh, what, what's the expertise that people will pay you for uh, that will uh, enable you to do this uh, uh, as a living? And so let's think about who's good at this. So I've just alluded to the fact that you need to have an expertise. You need to be an expert at something or at least good at it. Um, and you need to be self-motivated, a self-starter. You don't have a manager. Uh, you don't have somebody to set goals for you. You have to do that yourself. Uh, and you have to have a little bit of arrogance, just enough, but not too much. And I say that because you have to believe that you have something to contribute to the client that the client can't get to themselves. So you, even though you're coming into a business that somebody might have been in for five or 10 or 25 years sometimes, um, that you can help them figure something out that they can't figure out themselves. But you can't have so much arrogance that you put the client off uh, or that you sound like you know it all because you don't. Uh, the client knows their business. Now, we'll talk a little bit about specializing in, in uh, some vertical uh, in just a little while. But certainly, if the first thing you need to do when you go into a client is figure out how that client operates. Uh, and then you have to have the confidence to, uh, to feel like you can help them out. Has to be somebody who enjoys helping people. Uh, uh, somebody once joked that uh, the major uh, the, the major product of a consultant was an invoice, but that's not the case, not at all. The invoice is secondary. You need the invoice in order to live and do the job, uh, continue to do the job, but you have to enjoy helping people. Um, and you have to enjoy learning new things. Uh, you have to be a bit of an information junkie. Um, the firm that I worked in uh, had a particular... Uh, area of expertise in, in the field of competitive intelligence. We helped large companies figure out what their competitors were going to do or why they had done something or what they would do. Um, 
And we did work with companies that made everything from cheese to rocket ships. Uh, and so that's a sort of a, a horizontal, cuts across all industries, but it's a very narrow specialty, just the same. And that was our, that was our area. We had to learn new things about all kinds of companies. And you'll have to do the same thing. You'll have to learn new things about uh, companies in either a horizontal area or, or vertically, um, some particular, you know, uh, brewing, for example. There are a number of companies from the beginning of the process all the way through to, uh, uh, to the end that uh, uh, there's a fellow that I know who's an expert in brewing, and he, he, uh, he, he spends his time in that vertical, and he learns new things every place that he goes. And so you have to be, the other thing that's really important is you have to be willing to be one project away from unemployment. And uh, what that means is you've got a project going on, you should be doing some marketing, but usually if you're a solo or a small group, um, you're spending a lot of time project by project, and then uh, you have to make sure that you get the next project in, you are um, one project away from the cliff, the end of the uh, the end of the backlog that you have uh, as you get if you get together with a group and and uh, you put together a virtual firm uh, that cliff can get a little further away you can have a few projects uh, lined up but um, that is a factor it's not a steady paycheck uh, business goes up and down and your family has to be able to handle that um, when you go in to see a client you have to be willing to suspend judgment uh, as I said, you have to have a little bit of arrogance and confidence, but um, you have to wait and be willing to learn for a little while before you uh, begin to make judgments. Uh, and the best way to do that, to suspend judgment, is to just keep asking questions of, the, uh, of, a, of a client. And in fact, you ask a lot of questions even before you produce a proposal, and that will help you get the job. And we'll talk about that later. And finally, you have to be willing to tell it as it is, to speak truth to power. Uh, sometimes you come back in with a, a conclusion that the client doesn't really want to hear. It's your job to tell them, uh, tell them what you see. Uh, and uh, very often you'd be surprised that the, they're very grateful for that. Uh, and uh, that, that gets you sometimes to, to the next project. So let's talk about why clients buy consulting services. They may have some short-term needs. They need to have a particular project done. Um, when I was a solo at one point, uh, I had a client come, came to me looking for uh, help to build a, a factory that uh, that produced uh, a certain certain product for the automotive industry. Uh, and after that, they you know once that project was done, they didn't need me, so they just brought me in to build the factory. Uh, they may have limited internal resources or they want external expertise. Uh, there's a guy from uh, uh, Corning Glass who, uh, who uh, used to say an expert is somebody who lives more than 100 miles away from uh, Corning, New York. An expert is somebody who is from outside. They want that external expertise. Uh, sometimes they want it because even though they know the answer inside, they need to have somebody validate it from outside. Um, so that's the want validation part. Or they want a particular methodology um, or a qualified independent opinion. They want an outsider to deliver the bad news. That's the bit about speaking truth to power. And they uh, want to bridge an internal divide. You have two different groups in the company and they are convinced, each of them, that their perspective is correct. They're willing to listen to somebody from outside uh, to help them bridge that divide. And sometimes you'll find that somebody in upper middle management um, will uh, want, want to hire somebody to look good to their, uh, their immediate supervisors. They're the people at the next level up. Uh, so they want to look good to the boss. So those are all reasons why uh, people will buy consulting services. So how do we add value or do we? Um, and I think that the, there's a, a line from Daniel Kahneman's uh, book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, and Kahneman is a psychologist who's a Nobel laureate in economics, of all things. And uh, he wrote a really interesting book. Uh, if you have the, uh, an interest in, in learning a little bit more about how people make decisions, it's a great book to uh, take a look at, to, to read. 
And one of the things he says is it's easier to recognize other people's mistakes than our own. So just think about that and how that, that how true that is in your own life. It's certainly true in mine. Uh, and uh, the consultant's job is to recognize the other folks' mistakes or where they could improve or how they could do something better, uh, you know, something that they probably won't be able to see themselves uh, or they won't be able to see as easily or as quickly. So that's that's your stock and trade. It's easier to recognize the client's mistakes than they can themselves. And very often they recognize that. That's why you bring they bring you in in the first place. Okay, so now let's talk about your strategy and what you what you want to do. So this is something from an old, old book, 1980s, uh, what, uh, 43 years ago, Michael Porter's uh, Five Forces model from uh, competitive strategy. And you may have, if you've got an MBA, you may very well have seen this uh, in school. But Porter talks about how we tend to think about our, our businesses from the perspective of who the competitors are and you know how, what they what they're thinking about, but we tend to also forget that um, that uh, our our competitors are affected by outside forces. So they're affected by uh, how easy it is to get into the market, whether it's easy or difficult for new entrants to come in. Um, they're uh, affected by how easy it is for customers to choose between uh, providers. Um, they're affected by potential substitutes, not new entrants, but a different product or service that displaces the, uh, the people in the market. Um, and they're affected by powerful suppliers. So a couple of examples in the desktop and laptop computer industry, Microsoft has been, uh, and Intel, have, have, have the two of them have been very powerful suppliers. They've been able to get um, a great deal of their uh, uh, well, they, 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 they're the dominant suppliers, really, in those two businesses. Uh, and they can extract uh, a lot more value sometimes than the computer makers themselves. In fact, making desktop and laptop computers is not a very profitable business. Um, but um, Microsoft and Intel are certainly profitable. Um, or uh, potential substitutes. Um, think about um, the telephone and uh, the, the, the wireless phone that you've got in your, uh, your pocket now. Uh, was a substitute, is a substitute for wireline, uh, for landlines. And uh, in fact, landlines have, have gotten to the point where uh, the telephone companies don't, they don't really want them uh, at all, They're trying to get rid of them. So sometimes a substitute will come in either from a technology perspective or uh, somebody will come up with a better idea of the way to do something. Uh, and people in the market are affected by that. Um, so it, it's useful to understand this model when you're doing consulting um, from a couple of perspectives. One is it's a useful model as a way to think about the client's problems, the client's issues. And when you look at an industry, um, you think to yourself, well, how is our client, how is my client affected by the these outside forces, the new entrants, the customers, uh, choices, the potential substitutes, the power of suppliers, um, and uh, their needs are going to be uh, affected and will reflect back to what they're asking me based on that, that environment. And the second thing is, well, uh, what does Porter say about how you deal with all these things? Uh, he says, the way that companies successfully uh, deal is with this is by adopting uh, one or another of these generic strategies. They can differentiate the way that Volvo has typically done um, by uh, emphasizing safety. Uh, and uh, I, I'm old enough to have had, and I did have a 1966 Volvo, uh, and it was a safer car. Uh, it had a crash cage around it. It had uh, three-point seat belts seat belt over the shoulder before other cars had them. Uh, and... Uh, Volvo still emphasizes that, and they still sell at a higher price to some extent because people have that, that sense of who Volvo is. Um, you can try to be lower cost um, or be the lowest cost. You can, one of the risks of that is there only, can only be one low cost provider in the market. Consultants should never try to be low cost, never. That's not your job. Um, 
And so you can also try to focus geographically on a particular market segment. So in the automobile industry, Porsche or Smart, uh, Porsche obviously focuses on high-end, very sporty cars that handle very well, and Smart focuses on cars that um, are, are desired by people who only want a half a car. Uh, and uh, so where do you fit in this kind of thing? It's typically differentiating yourself as a consultant. How do I separate myself from other consultants? Because there are a lot of consultants in the world. And what do I focus on? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself when you think about where to market yourself and how to market yourself. How do I separate myself from others and what's my focus? And it's really important to separate yourself and think about focus because the threat of new entrants in the consulting industry is infinite. Uh, a, 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 a new entrant is uh, somebody with a, a, a computer and a briefcase. Uh, and sometimes they don't even need the briefcase. So. Uh, it's really easy to get into this market. It's much more difficult to make a living out of it uh, unless you figure out where to differentiate, how to separate yourself, uh, and what you should be uh, looking at as, a, as the market segment that you serve, whether it's a horizontal market, um, something that cuts across a whole bunch of different industries that you provide to people, or a vertical segment, a specific industry that you want to make yours. So vertical segments focused on an industry or a market, biopharma drug testing, brewing, real estate management, taking care of plants. Horizontal segments are focused on an activity that cuts across many verticals, financial management, website design support, human resources support. You can fill in the, the blanks for more examples for yourselves. Um, so, um, Think about where you want to be, how your expertise relates to one of those. And typically, you'll find something that you've worked in, uh, that somebody has already, you, you've already learned the ropes uh, by, uh, by doing this uh, for, uh, for another organization. Um, and if you're coming to consulting um, sort of right out of school, as it were, that's a risky thing to do. Um, you're actually well advised to go to work for a consulting firm in order to pick up uh, uh, some of that expertise, but it should be one or the other. It should be clear in your mind what you're doing. That's perhaps the most important thing. Is, you know, what am I focused on here? Okay. Um, and then we talk about differentiation and, and, you know, focus and so forth. It is possible to compete with big guys. Uh, here's something that is now, this, this uh, cartoon is now 30 years old. Uh, from the early days of the internet, uh, two dogs talking on the internet. Nobody knows you're a dog. Okay, so you can have a presence that looks professional, and we're going to show you some examples of that in just a moment, um, and come across as being uh, uh, qualified, being capable, uh, being able to help a client. Uh, because on the internet, nobody knows how how many people you have, whether it's just you or just you and a group of people who have set up a virtual organization or you're part of a giant consulting firm. So uh, it's possible to compete in this market. Again, if you think about how it is that you're, that you're going to compete and where it is that you, that you belong. So small firm, big website focused on one market cent, uh, segment. This is the uh, Regulatory Clinical uh, Consulting Group, RNC Consulting Group. And uh, so what do they have? They show you the segments that they, the things that they do. They help with regulatory affairs. Um, they help with clinical development. They help with compliance and quality. And I have no idea what HEOR is, okay? but apparently they help with that as well. Uh, and they have these things uh, across the top of their website. So people interested in one or the other can go and see what, what they have to say about themselves. They always have about us or something of that sort, who their leadership is, uh, and you should do the same thing. That's a typical model for a, a website for a consulting firm. Uh, let's look at a couple of others. Uh, again, this is one that's focused on a particular market segment. Um, here's one. This is the company that I used to uh, uh, used to work for uh, that does uh, 
competitive strategy, competitive intelligence consulting. It's a horizontal market um, and services. What do we do? These are the industries we support. Um, uh, some insights, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, and who we are. Uh, and um, so that's a, it's a design that I think says professional. Um, you want to go to a website designer who does work for professional services firms. You don't want something that's garish, that you've, uh, uh, that's uh, put together uh, with too many colors and different fonts and so forth. You really want somebody who can do a sophisticated design for you have to pay a little bit for that, uh, but uh, it's really important. That's your front, uh, your front to the world, your front door to the world. Um, so let's talk a little bit about marketing. Um, you need that website. You want it to be classy, not brassy. Um, there's, uh, uh, I've given you a couple of examples here to take a look at. Um, IntelligentDecisionPartners.com. Uh, they have a. You want to have a blog commentary links to other sites, uh, and uh, there's a, a reason behind that, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, you want to show the resources and team with headshot photos. Uh, you want to have some testimonials. You want to work with somebody who can help you do search engine optimization. So, you know, if you're really good with web design, you could do this yourself, but honestly, um, the best thing that you can do is find somebody to design that website for you with take a look at some of the examples of these firms and others in the consulting area that are not giant sized firms. These are very small organizations uh, and uh, get a sense of the way you should look. Um, social media, LinkedIn for sure, maybe Facebook. The other platforms don't, don't make a lot of sense for professional services. And don't forget associations. Join the organizations that your clients join. Uh, and that your professional, your potential referral sources join. So industry associations, associations related to your own expertise. There's something called the Institute of Management Consultants for solo and small, uh, uh, small consulting firms. Industry standard groups like IEEE. Associations uh, have a lot of utility for you and it's, there's a small cost to joining them. It's very, very useful. And let's take a look at you know how, how wh why that is how that they help okay um, so uh, first of all one of the things you want to think about doing in your website is giving away industry knowledge for free put some of the information that you know in your blog about the industry as a whole so uh, you do that on your website um, you. Uh, want to speak uh, at uh, where potential clients gather. So IEEE, a local chapter, um, you want to join the organization, offer to speak on a particular topic if you're uh, in that uh, in, in that engine, electrical engineering world. You want to go to industry conferences, including both local and regional ones and sometimes national ones. Uh, they'll, they'll be more expensive to go to, but you know, once you begin to develop a name, uh, that's an appropriate place to go. Again, you'll meet potential clients, you'll meet potential resource, uh, referral sources, and you'll hear other people talking uh, about what they do. And it's really useful uh, to learn from uh, other consultants. They're not exactly competitors. There are so many consultants uh, in the world uh, that um, it's sort of like raising uh, corn. Uh, you're not in competition with the farmer down the road. You're part of a market. And I, I think it's useful for a consultant, especially a solo or a small firm to view themselves that way. Um, you want to join chambers of commerce if your market is local business. Um, you want to go to economic development conferences if uh, that's your area, um, local workshops. The important thing is you give away industry knowledge for free when you go to those, th those, uh, those meetings and so forth and try to speak at them. You never give project work away for free. You sell your proprietary knowledge, your project knowledge, to groups of potential clients. You can sell individually and do projects for them, or you can offer workshops and webinars. So I mentioned that the, when I got into solo consulting, I went to a workshop, sort of like this, um, uh, and uh, the person who was running it collected a fee. I think it was fifty or hundred dollars at the time, uh, and. Um, uh, and he got a got a venue. He I think we went to a hotel 
uh, and uh, we probably had lunch or something of that sort, he took a bit of a risk. He promised the hotel a certain number of people and uh, uh, made sure that um, that he, he he knew that what he was doing in terms of being able to fill that room. Uh, and in-person has a great potential for, uh, for turning people who come into clients. Uh, the firm that I work for used to run a series of uh, workshops on competitive, how to do competitive intelligence. And people said to us, aren't you giving away um, your expertise? Well, no, we gave away the concept and how uh, we might do it, but do the work. But in fact, people needed us typically uh, to actually do projects. And so that that involved getting people in the room who we could turn into clients. It requires taking a risk. As I said, it requires an email list. Um, you can get that from joining that association and building your own uh, email list. And you get it by having uh, a contact form on, the, uh, on your website, of course. Don't skimp on the venue. Go to a good place. Uh, don't go to the Red Roof Inn. Uh, and uh, don't skimp on the audiovisual setup. Look for similar events as a guide to how to price things uh, and go to some yourself uh, as a, to get a sense of, you know, well, what are other people offering in this, uh, in this vertical or in this industry group? Okay. Uh, one of the things you can do, uh, I say you give away industry knowledge. Well, you give away some, you can have a blog, you can put out white papers. Here's, um, just a commentary on competing in thousands of markets, how IT firms can improve their success in competitive bids. Every IT firm uh, is going to face this kind of a situation uh, uh, in, in, uh, as they're doing business. They have competitive bids to, uh, uh, that they have to succeed in. Um, so if you have some knowledge about this that's in general uh, useful to people in the, in the field, put together a, a white paper or put together a blog on it put it on your website. Um, and aim for, when you, when you do this, you're aiming for an ongoing relationship, a consultative sell, not a transactional sell. So you're not selling real estate or a car. You want the client to come back again and again. And in any case, the client has to feel like you're going to help them, not just give them something, take the money and go away. So that means there's a selling cycle for what you're offering. It might take weeks or even months sometimes for a larger project. Um, and you have to know the selling cycle for what you offer. Again, talk to other consultants. Talk to, uh, uh, talk to people who have uh, been clients. Uh, you know, Get a sense of what the client has to go through in order to get authorization, make a decision, get authorization to spend the money uh, that you're looking for out of that project. Visit the client. Um, the line that's crossed out here is what I was told uh, a long time ago, sell in a suit, work in a jacket. No, you don't have to do that anymore. Wear the industry uniform, whatever the industry uniform is, a little bit upscale, you don't want to look too casual. Um, but uh, if you uh, walk in in a suit and a, and a tie in a lot of companies today, uh, people will look at you and say, oh, well, who is this? You know, what's this all about? Or uh, you come in in, uh, uh, in, in a, uh, a pantsuit and in fact, you're expected to uh, look much more casual than that. So uh, think about what the industry uniform is. Visit the client. Ask a lot of questions about the client when you go there or the potential client. Don't talk about yourself. This is not about you. It's about them. So if you visit, take a tour of their operation, if you possibly can, if they offer that, figure out what it would take for you to make the client look good. And then you write a proposal that speaks to the client's needs. So that's what this consultative cell is all about. Um, so how do you do a proposal? Most of the time they're PowerPoint, thinking about them, be concise, it takes two or three minutes per slide. If you have 30 minutes to present, that's only 10 to 15 slides. Don't go with 50. Uh, you won't get through them. People's eyes will glaze over. Uh, you want to be concise in what you say. Boil your message down. So the first bit of the in the PowerPoint and the, or in a presentation, 
understanding of your needs. Why is the client looking for outside help? What outcome do they want? Use industry jargon, but carefully. Don't, don't overdo it. Uh, and particularly don't use uh, jargon from one client over in another client's operation unless you're sure that it's industry jargon, not specific to the client. What's the scope of work? What are we going to do for you? Who will do the work? I'll do it. My colleague will do it. Whatever. What's the methodology? How and where will we do that work for you? Will we be on site? Will we be remote? A little bit of hybrid? Um, what do you need from the client? What, do they, what kinds of information do they need to give you? Do they need to take you through their operation? Uh, do they need to give you contact information for people in the industry? What, you know, what do you want from them? What are the deliverables? What are we going to get? Uh, what are they going to get when you're done? PowerPoint presentation, written report, software that works, a factory, financial projection, a healthy philodendron. What is it that the, that your deliverable is? Um, and then how long will it take and what will it cost the client? And what about project expenses, including travel? Um, and then there's an appendix, the qualifications and experience of the people doing the project. This is where you talk about yourself and any key members of the, of the team. It's a terrible mistake to put that at the beginning. You put that at the end after you've demonstrated that you understand their needs. You put in some abstracts of prior work, a paragraph of, for previous projects that you've done that are relevant, even if you've done them for um, someone before you became a consultant. Uh, that's, that's legitimate to put that together. And your terms and conditions and the confidentiality, confidentiality statement when you expect to be paid, how many days from the date of invoice, limit your liability. There are standard uh, terms and conditions that you can pull down uh, off of the internet without uh, a lot of difficulty. Um, so those are the that's the sort of structure and the content of a proposal. And I, I don't I, I want to emphasize again to the point of being mildly obnoxious. The first bit is how you understand what they need. What is the client looking for? Why are they looking for it? What outcome do they want? What outcome? What do they want to result from this? And so that's where you put your, uh, your emphasis, what you're going to do for them, methodology, and so forth. Um, and so the, just to nail this, it's about them, not about you. Um, so we have Dilbert, and I know Dilbert is no longer, per, he's now persona non grata, but this is still an awfully good cartoon. All I do is travel, work, uh, and eat unhealthy food, says the consultant from uh, Booz uh, McKidney. Um, I'm a total failure at managing my own life, and yet people hire me for business advice. I haven't slept since October. And Dilbert's response is, I was told there'd be PowerPoint slides. Where are they? You know, that's what I came for. Client doesn't need to hear about you. They just want results. Okay, what do I charge? Probably more than you think. Uh, the basis for what you charge is the time the project will take. You work 50 weeks, 40 hours, 2,000 hours a year. Nominally, you'll work more than that. About half the time, you're going to be marketing, not working on a project. So that means you've got roughly 1,000 hours in which to build your time out and earn the living that you want. And you'll have expenses that you don't have if you're currently somebody's employee. Maybe 20 or 25, 25 or 30% of your uh, 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 of your income. Um, and so think about how much revenue do I have to gross in order to cover my living costs, uh, uh, support my family, um, do whatever it is that I want to do, What's your target? I, I don't really uh, uh, mind what it is, whether it's uh, $125,000 a year or $300,000 a year. That's up to you. Uh, it's what you need, what you think you, uh, uh, and what you think you can get. Uh, and so if you have 1,000 billable hours when you're starting off, because the other 1,000 hours you're, you're marketing, uh, if, you're likely, you'll have, if you're lucky, you'll have that 1,000 hours over the course of a year. Um, your hourly fee has to be $125 an hour or $1,000 a day to get to that gross income, that $125,000. It has to be $2,400 a day to get to $300,000. Uh, 
And you have to have some sense of what the market is, what people pay for your kinds of services um, uh, before you can you know, set those rates. And if you make that calculation and you see that, well, I need to bill $1,800, but the consultants in this field don't get that much. This is it's not the field for you. You can't do this. It's really important to be coldly realistic about this this setup. You have to bill enough time um, in order to make a living. And if you can see that down the road, great. If you see that the market that you're going after doesn't pay that much, for example, if you're interested in consulting to nonprofits, typically nonprofits pay substantially less for consulting and government pays less for consulting than, uh, than uh, for-profit businesses. Uh, and small companies pay less than uh, than medium-sized and large companies. So if you're going after small business, that's a tough place to make a living as a consultant. There are some areas where you can, um, web design, for example, uh, marketing, uh, uh, social media marketing, but there are a lot of areas where you can't. Um, so look at the industry, calculate your fee by the hour of the day, or figure out what the flat fee should be for a project. Don't cut your rate to get a client's business. Don't, no freebies. Uh, and I think I've said that earlier in this, uh, this discussion about the information that you give away is industry information, not your proprietary uh, skills. Okay, so that's an important thing to, to consider. Um, and then if I'm going to think about it, well, how long does the project take? Doing a project will typically take 60 or 70% of the total hours that you put in. And that's a just a rule of thumb, okay? It's not perfect. Um, but um, it will if it's going to take you 40 hours to do the work, that total project will take 55 to 65 hours. And if you have to travel time, that may add to it. And you need to be paid for all of that. When you do your proposal and you put that chart together of how many hours I'm going to bill for, it's not just the 40 hours, it's the 55 to 65. So what are the time, what are the things that you need to do? You need to review the scope of the client. You need to execute that scope, some additional in, initial research, some interviews with the client, perhaps, interviews at an industry conference, uh, some project related travel to get to that conference and get back, um, some administrative time. You have to write the report. You have to put the report together. Um, all of those things uh, add up and uh, executing the scope is just that um, 60 to 70 percent of the total time that you're likely to spend. Hey, Mike, I have a question about the oh. pricing. Yeah, go ahead. Does it, does it make sense to offer a lower rate for your first client to get testimonials? Well, um, be very careful about that because you'll, you'll never get any more money than that from that first client. So um, you can think about that. Uh, I, I would be very cautious about the client who wants to engage someone just because they're uh, substantially less expensive. That's not always a good client. They don't always see the value. So mm, I, I would say you might want to do that under some circumstances. Very, do it very, very carefully. Uh, it's a good question. A lot of people ask that question. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we have another uh, question up there, uh, too, so I can see. Is that something relative, that relevant to what we're doing right now? Yeah, I'm going to follow up on that. It got, okay. at, it got asked right at the beginning, and I, I think we might have addressed it. So. Okay, good. Okay. Um, if you're working uh, with a virtual team, you don't need to employ uh, a team of people or part of, be part of a, uh, an organization with, uh, uh, with employees. You can create a virtual team, particularly post-pandemic. It's really, everybody's very comfortable with Zoom meetings and working as a team uh, 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 over, uh, over the internet. Um, you can find the help that you need from the network of people that you know and the professional associations or the industry associations that you join. And so how do you allocate the fee among team members? And this is something that uh, somebody uh, gave me when I was uh, first starting off and he had a lot more experience than I did. And we did a couple of projects together. Um, and he, he, in one case, I brought the project. In another case, he brought the project. Um, the person who brings the client gets more or less 20% of the fee. The person who puts in those project hours 
remember I said it would be uh, uh, just a, a, a portion of the total project uh, costs would be the actual execution, but that's worth 60% of the fee and the project management, keeping everybody going together and making sure that the client is tracking, giving you what, you, what they need and what you need from them and so forth. And then 10% for that and 10% for report writing. And that was the way we worked out the project fee. This is not hard and fast, but it's typical. It's a reasonable estimate of where uh, you might go if you're working with a team of people. And it, typically in a project, you might have multiple people uh, putting in project hours and only one person doing the project management or one or two people doing the report writing. Uh, so that's a, a pretty good rule of thumb, uh, just like the rule of thumb about setting, uh, setting the, the fee for your services. Um, something you absolutely need to do is set up a limited liability company. Uh, it's not an expensive process. Uh, and uh, so it protects your personal assets. That's the major reason why you do it. But larger clients often want to do business with a business and they want you to have liability insurance. So they don't want to do business with a solo who's unincorporated. They, they really want to see that LLC uh, and they want to see the liability insurance for the LLC, not for you personally, but for the limited liability company. You don't need a lawyer to set up a limited liability company in Massachusetts. You do need $500 a year. Um, and you can get a taxpayer ID for free from the Internal Revenue Service. And so let's take a look at those. Here are the, the steps that you go through. The first thing is um, you apply for that employer ID. And you do that on the IRS website, and there's the link for it. And I just checked that link today. Um, so I'm, uh, excuse me, just a moment. There we go. Um, uh, and so I know it's live. It's the right one. Sometimes these links change. And then you go to the Secretary of State of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, and there's a list of things to do as you're starting a business. Each one of those is a link. Click on the link, and it will, the, it will lead you through the process. And at the end, you file with the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Secretary of, of the Commonwealth, to um, uh, to set up your corporation to develop to to register a new entity. And so there's the link to the corporate um, the corporation uh, division of the Secretary of State of Massachusetts. Those are the things you go through in that pretty much in that sequence. Uh, the most important one one uh, uh, is number two because it will lead you to all of the others. Uh, but uh, you can get your employer ID first. And you need that because then you go and set up a checking account in the name of your business. The bank will want you to be registered with the state and, they, and they'll want that employer ID number. They'll typically want you print out um, a, uh, a statement from the Secretary of State's office showing your registration, that you have registered that business. Um, you walk into the bank with that and... A lot of smaller banks will offer free small business checking accounts. Don't pay to uh, don't pay fees for your business checking account. Um, uh, one example that I'll give you is Eastern Bank uh, offers free small business uh, checking, um, but there are others. A lot of uh, local banks will do that. The big um, uh, national uh, na banks that have a national presence typically won't. Just Google free business checking to find somebody in your uh, in your area. Um, all the revenue from your consulting goes into that business checking account. The client, you cut an invoice that has your limited liability company name on it, and you have the client pay the limited liability company to deposit that check into your business checking account. You take money out of it for yourself. Uh, that's, you know, the, the, the money doesn't just accumulate there. Um, but um, the, the money goes in and that, that validates that, in fact, you're operating as a limited liability company. You're, you're protected um, if somebody decides that, uh, uh, that you've done something wrong and they, um, and they uh, file suit with you or make a claim against you. Um, it's only what's in that business checking account that's, uh, that's vulnerable, uh, not your home or any of your uh, uh, savings or anything of that sort. And then after you set up the bank account, go to an insurance broker, a commercial insurance broker, and buy professional liability insurance. 
and there might be five hundred or a thousand dollars for uh, for a solo practitioner uh, to buy a liability insurance, depending on what you're doing. If it's a lot more than that, go get a competitive quote from another broker. Okay, those are the steps um, we've talked about. Um, how to write a proposal, how to price your time, uh, how to price the proposal and work with the group. Uh, we talked about setting up that uh, business uh, structure. Um, are you st sure you still want to do this? Um, can you and your family tolerate that employment cliff? And it's not just you, it's your family it has to be able to, uh, uh, has to be able to deal with the fact that you've got a project going on uh, but after that, there's no income that's going to be coming in until you get the next project. Um, you want to focus on a market segment, whether it's vertical or horizontal, it doesn't matter. Just you need to have uh, decide what your focus is. You want to get a professional website built for you. It says build a professional website there. You want to have somebody do that for you in all probability. You want to develop a proposal template. There are a lot of models on the internet, but follow that model that I gave you, the first thing is, what do we understand of your problem? What are, you, what are we going to do for you? How are we going to do it? And then it's about you at the end. Don't undercharge. Um, I, it's very tempting to say, well, I'll you know cut my price for the first time here. Um, it's, it's a very risky thing to do because you'll never be able to raise your rate with that client again. Uh, and or it will be very difficult to raise your rate uh, in, in the near term. So don't undercharge. You need that flow of income in order to support your family. If you can't see that happening, you don't belong here. Um, and do set up a limited liability company uh, and follow those uh, those steps that I've given. Okay, um, let's go to any questions or comments that people have. Yeah, uh, there is just a lot of great interaction in chat. So I'm going to yeah, do my yeah, best. I, I, I <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Uh, there was a, a comment about international consulting. Yes. Could, can you comment on, let's see. How so did, how... Um, I need to know a little bit about more uh, more about international. I mean, you can certainly take your services overseas and, and provide them um, to people in an international uh, set, you know, international setting. I... Um, uh, and, and when I first got started in consulting on my own, one of the things I offered was helping companies find markets overseas. Uh, and so uh, there you can, uh, there are a lot of resources on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, and then there's a place that you can go. It's really important. I should have mentioned it. It's the Kirstein branch of the Boston Public Library to get um, help on researching your market, whether it's domestic or international. It's downstairs in the main library building, the, the entrance, go through the entrance that faces Boylston Street, not the, the classic building on that faces Copley Square. But there are reference librarians in there um, who can help you find information about you know, really almost any market uh, and uh, can help you out, particularly if you're looking for information uh, from overseas, which can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to get to if you're just Googling it. Um, I hope that if there's more to that question, please put a comment back in the chat and we'll see if we can um, we can deal with it. Um, um, are there startup loans for consulting businesses? Do you know? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. Um, without a track record in consulting, uh, it's very difficult to get a, a, you can take a, if you, you know, if you have, um, you can get a, 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 an equity line on your home or something of that sort. It's, uh, you know, you don't need a lot of money to get into this business. You need enough to um, uh, to launch, to put food on the table for a little while while you're working up, working the business up. Uh, and you have to have that website and some other, you know, credentialing and so forth, the 500 bucks that you need for the, the state. But um, it shouldn't be terribly expensive um, to do that. Um, and again, a bank, unless you have a track record, um, a, a lender is not very likely to, to be interested. After a year or so, a couple of years, um, and you're uh, trying to grow by perhaps um, hiring some employees and you need to you know, have some cash ahead of time, if you can show track record of success, then you might be able to get a loan, most likely from a local bank, not from one of the big banks. 
Um, when do you start thinking about expanding and hiring another um, another or other consultants to be part of your firm um, right. if you're successful and are have been operating as a solo um, sure. consultant so far? So the first stage is to bring people in on a, on a uh, contract basis, uh, work with somebody, uh, you know, you, you don't go from one to one to two um, uh, immediately. Uh, uh, as you begin to get busy, you bring somebody uh, in to help you out. Um, that person may or may not be the person that you decide to hire. Um, but uh, the first hire is the toughest one because you're doubling, uh, you're, you're doubling the amount of food that you have to put on the table. Uh, and uh, so you have to be really comfortable that you can sustain that person um, as an employee and as an employer, you have some obligations, you have to pay them a salary, um, you need to pay um, uh, withholding tax for them and so forth. Um, so uh, take your time with that. Um, but once you get to that point, you want to go to a payroll services firm, for example, that will take care of uh, handling, uh, uh, handling payroll for you. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I've got lots yeah. of questions about, or a couple of questions about contract um, templates and things like that. Sure. Uh, certainly some people, you're going to be able to find some things on the website, oh, but yeah. honestly, yeah. Uh, we do have mentors that that's what they do for SCORE. <laughs> they just talk about contracts and negotiations and things right. like that. Um, and certainly um, we can schedule you with one of our, our um, SCORE mentors. Um, so I would suggest that there's some other people asking about really, how do you determine the pricing and where to start? Um, you know, it's really that again, if that's really getting into the specifics of your business, right. uh, coming and talk to score mentor is a great, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. I was going to say, for, uh, you, there's a, there's sort of a balance between what the market will pay and what you have to find out what the market will pay and what you need to uh, earn and if there's you know if there's a meeting there uh, if those two things merge together um, that's great and uh, you can think about uh, think about doing this um, if there's a mismatch between what the market will pay and what you feel you need uh, in order to uh, uh, to keep your family going uh, then you have to you have to wait you have to do something different um, let the let the market tell you let you have to learn from the market uh, let the market tell you what uh, uh, what your services are likely to be worth. And would uh, you be setting up a budget, uh, how to, you know, to figure out what you think you need to bring be bringing in? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you if you're currently earning a salary and you're okay on that, then there was a question here about how much more than my salary do I need to bring in? Well, you do need to bring in that an additional 20, 25 percent. Um, you need to pay for your own health care, for example. Um uh, you uh, need to pay your, the full uh, full cost of Social Security, the 16 um, uh, percent. You need to pay uh, uh, pay for uh, uh, insurance. Uh, you need to pay for uh, website hosting and so forth. Those are all expenses that come in on top of uh, what your uh, uh, what your what your salary is or what your uh, uh, net earnings are uh, in order to support yourself. Uh, do you have a LinkedIn account? Do I have a LinkedIn account? Yep. I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Well, somebody was asking if, how would they connect to you? Yeah. That's oh, cool. sure. Well, uh, the easy way to connect to me is, um, let's go back to this. Uh, that's my email address at SCORE. Great. Okay. Um, I think we've hit the top of the hour. Um, I know that some of you probably um, have more questions. Certainly reach out to SCORE. That's what they're there for. They can get into the nitty gritty for your situation, go through what you need specifically to you. So, I mean, that's what the mentors are there for. So I, I definitely strongly, strongly encourage you to continue the conversation um, and reach out if you don't already have a mentor. Um, okay. I, All right. Well, no, I think, uh, go um, ahead. Uh, it, there's one one chat. Would you the, the question about international? Will you set the business up in the same way for international work as an LLC? Yes. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yes, that definitely want to do the same exact same thing. Uh, even if your client is uh, your clients or you're expecting your clients to be overseas. Okay. All right. Great. All right. That wraps it up. Then thanks, All Mike. Right. Fantastic right. as always. Thank you.
Thanks. Great. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye.